You're listening to the Atlanta Dream Center Church Podcast. We hope that today's message edifies and encourages you to live transformed by Jesus, grow in your faith, and walk in your God dreams. Hey, look, we're in a series, and uh, I'm going to dive right in. And uh, we've been talking about investments. And uh, last two weeks, we're on the part one of this investment series, and we talked about relationships. We talked about marriage. We talked about singleness. And then last week, we talked about your enemies, your brothers in the world. But today, I'm going to go into the next part of this series. And how many of you guys want to have a life change? Anyone in here want to have a life change? Like four of us? Uh, How many of you guys want to get better? How about that? How many of you guys want to get better? Okay, a lot more of us. Yeah, that's a life change. Um, So if you didn't know. And so I want to talk about some life-changing disciplines that you should take on. We're going to talk about investing in some disciplines, not emotions, not spiritual things, though they are spiritual, but disciplines. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, buckle up, puppy. I don't know what that means, so go ahead and say it. (laughs) That was weird as heck, dude. (laughs) So these next three weeks, man, we're going to be talking about Thanksgiving, forgiveness, and then finally, we're going to talk about generosity. But today, we're only talking about Thanksgiving. How many guys got some things to be thankful for? Anyone in this house? Yeah, yeah. Anyone in here? If you're taking notes, I want you to write down something you're thankful for. If you're not taking notes, I want you to start taking notes right now. I just want you to write down in your phone what I'm thankful for. Just do it right now. Take this moment. I want you to stop for a second and just give God some thanks, man. I, I believe that it's going to change everything in your life. And I'm not the only one who believes this. Uh, There's people all around the world who know the secret of Thanksgiving. Actually, how many guys, uh, where where are my people who show up after 10 o'clock? Raise your hand. It's okay. I'm not shaming you. Yeah, yeah, someone's walking in right now. Hey, what's up, y'all? That's sick. That was tight. Like, yeah, I'm here. Uh, Hey, look, I I don't know if you know this. Uh, There's this, we do this. uh, Did you know there's music before we start this? Did you know that? And... uh, (laughs) In the, very, in the very beginning of church, we do this thing where we give God thanks, all of us. And what we do, we just, we just lift up our voices and we say, man, God, we're so thankful for who you are. It says in scriptures that give him the praise of your lips in thanksgiving. And that, that doesn't mean you just stay in your mind. How many of you guys like to pray in your mind? Who prays in their mind in here? Yeah, good for you guys. That's awesome. Hey, that works. I'm not against that. But how many of you guys like praying out loud? How many of you guys hate praying out loud, actually? Let me ask you that. Yeah, like four of us. Okay, okay. I know a lot of you guys are liars. That's okay. We'll, we'll have repentance at the end. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but you should start practicing Thanksgiving out loud. Uh, and we do it here every Sunday at 10 a.m., right in the beginning. We do it at 9 a.m. As a, as a group of people. We say, man, let's just lift up our voices. And can we just do that for a second? Do you guys mind getting a little weird with it? You guys cool with getting a little weird? Anyone in here a little weird, right? Can we just lift up our voices? Can you just tell God how thankful you are real quick? Come on, lift up your voice. God, there is no one like you. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Yes, Lord. Come on, that's something that, how many of you guys were raised in church? Yeah, that's that old school church, you know, those dusty old people would be coming in here. They wouldn't have nothing. And they'd come give God praise out loud. And we're going to talk about, man, it was that offensive to call them dusty. They were dusty. And that's not offensive, I guess. I want to talk about what Thanksgiving is. Uh, I want to talk to you about why you ought to do it. And we're going to go over some ROIs, return on your investment, man, because you and I should be investing in this unnatural discipline to say thanks to give thanks all the time. And there's a scripture, my wife showed me this last night. You got your Bibles, Colossians chapter three. I love this. Paul's writing to the church. In verse 15, he says this, and let the peace of God rule in your heart to which also you are called to one body and be thankful. Everyone say thankful. thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. A lot of your translations will say with gratitude. Everyone say gratitude. Man, and then it goes on. It says, and whatever you do in the word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. Everyone say thanks Thanks. to God the Father through him. This scripture cracked me up. In one sentence, Paul's like, hey, be thankful, have gratitude, be thankful. You know why? Because it's the most unnatural thing that you could do is to have thanks. Now, how many of you guys wish you could have more stuff? Be honest, it's okay. How many of you guys want some more stuff? Anyone in here? Yeah, yeah. How many of you guys want less stuff? Raise your hand. Yeah, find those people who just raise their hand and give them your stuff, okay? Just do it, all right? 
No, but man, I, I'm telling you, man, uh, so many of us are caught up in what we want and what we need, or I, I put quotes around need, like what we feel like we need to get to the next level. But I love that scriptures three times in just a one sentence. He says, man, guys, be thankful, have gratitude, and I, I can't get enough of it. And I'm going to tell you right now, me and my family, my wife and my kids, we've made a huge discipline in our life every day because Paul had to mention it three times. I realized we don't give thanks enough. So every day we get up in the morning and we say, hey, let's give the Lord thanks. And it's changed our lives. And I want to have you today walk out of this place with the tools to change your life. Anyone down for that? I'm down for that. So if you're not, too bad. <laughs> Check this out, man. Two researchers on social psychology simplified Thanksgiving into a two-step process. Recognizing the one who, I'm sorry, recognizing that one has obtained a positive outcome. How many of you guys got some good stuff? Anyone in here? How many of you guys had some good outcomes in your life? Anyone in here? I, I look at your neighbor and say, are you paying attention? Shake him a little bit. Ask your neighbor right now. Are you paying attention? Ask him. Go ahead, ask him. Yeah. Now, how many of you guys had some good things happen in your life? Let me try that again. There we go. There we go. Man, I've had some good things. But having good things and recognizing good things is only the first part of Thanksgiving. The second part is recognizing that there is an external source for that positive outcome. Now, how many of you guys could recognize that God has done great things in your life? Man, me too. And we're going to talk about, man, this is an important part of what Thanksgiving is. Recognizing that you've had something good or a good outcome and recognizing the external source for which it came from. What is Thanksgiving? Recognizing what you have and recognizing where it came from. And check this out. Oftentimes, I think Thanksgiving is emotional. How many of you guys love your emotions? Anyone in here? How many of you guys feel like your emotions trick you? Anyone in here? They are tricking you sometimes. And check this out, man. Yeah, discipline, the, this discipline of Thanksgiving is not an emotional thing. And I want to kind of get this out of the way because how many of you guys have ever had to do something when you didn't feel like it? Anyone in here have that? Where are my parents at? You guys know what I'm talking about. All parents know what that is. And that's a sacrifice. That's love. And what we do as people, sometimes we don't know how to give thanks unless first we have the emotion behind it. But I want to dismiss that. When we talk about this definition of this process, what Thanksgiving is, it doesn't say when someone feels a positive outcome. It says when they recognize it. Now, I don't know if you know this, but your emotions are dependent on how you recognize things. Did you know that? How many of you guys have seen people happy about things they should be sad about? Anyone ever see that before? How many of you guys have seen people sad about things they should be happy about? Anyone see that before? Listen, your emotions, they're beautiful. But they're just the characteristic of what you're recognizing in your life. And sometimes when we walk into Thanksgiving, I just got to dispel something really quick about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is not supposed to be an emotional reaction. If I could be bold, most of your life is not supposed to be an emotional reaction. I want you to hear me on this for a second. Thanksgiving is supposed to be something that you practice, that you sit and you say, I'm going to sit and recognize what I have and who it's from. I'm not going to wait till the feeling overwhelms me where I go, oh, I just want to cry. They're so good to me. You say, no, I'm going to make a practice of it. And I'm going to tell you why. There's this really great story, actually, about these guys, this one guy who really fully did the total process of Thanksgiving. If you have your Bibles, it's in Luke chapter 17, 11 through 19. Now, listen, I'm flying through this sermon because uh, I have to go potty, okay? And uh, <laughs> I'm not joking. And I didn't go. So if I'm dancing, it's not the Spirit of the Lord, all right? I got to go, all right? So I, if I'm speaking fast, you know why? Forgive me. <laughs> That's too honest for you. I'm sorry, too. And I say potty because I have kids, if that was also confusing to you. Luke 17, verse 11 through 19. This is a great example of someone walking out the two-part process of the discipline, not the emotion, the discipline of Thanksgiving. It says this, Now it happened as Jesus went to Jerusalem, and he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. Pause for a second. Jesus is walking around, and if you don't know this, lepers in the community were cast out of the city. And they had to sit outside the city wall. And as he's walking outside the city, there's ten men. They have leprosy. And leprosy is this disease that eats away your skin. Limbs will just fall off. People's noses, ears, things will just fall off. Eventually coming to your death because it, it mutilates you. 
So these 10 men are standing outside the city. And, and, and just to give you a little context, these are Jews and Samaritans. These are not the same group, but they are totally cast out of society. No one could get near them. They were alone. And it says this in verse 13, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now I want to say something about that really quick, which is going to, we're going to talk about this in a minute. But how many of you guys have ever needed Jesus to do something in your life? Man, me too. How many of you guys have found yourself saying out loud, Jesus, help me? Anyone in here? Man, out loud. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm going to be honest with you. I think I've gotten more out loud about my needs than I have about the things that God's already done for me. And I love what's going to happen next in the story. This is what happens. Jesus, in verse 14, it says, Jesus saw them and Jesus said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was, as they went, they were cleansed. That means they were made whole. That means their, their leprosy disappeared. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice, everyone say loud voice. He glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the other nine? Were they not only found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And this is what Jesus says to him. Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. I want to point out what I was pointing out earlier. I love this story of the 10 lepers. It's not a parable. This is a historical part. This is God saying, hey, or the disciples saying, this is what we saw. We had witnesses. And this, there's these 10 lepers and they all got healed, but only one of them came back. And this is what I recognize in this story. This is the two-part process of Thanksgiving. Because I could guarantee that the other nine were pretty happy that they got healed. How many of you guys think that's probably true? Anyone in here think that's probably true? They were probably pretty excited to go back home. They were probably pumped that their outcome was so positive. But real Thanksgiving has a second step, recognizing where it came from. And only one disciple decided to go back and truly give thanks. How many of us have had great rewards from God and never told them how grateful we are? That's wild to me. And it's not just the big things. How many of you guys have ever uh, recognized? Maybe, have you guys ever had that? Where are, my, where are my crazy Christians at? Where are you wild Christians at? Where are you guys at? A few of us? Don't be shy. Come on, get wild with it, dog. Four of us. <laughs> you are not wild, okay? That was the most calm, wild Christian I've ever seen. But this is what I want to say to my wild Christian. You guys ever have that moment where you're giving God thanks and you start getting like, thank you for the birds in the air, you know? <laughs> And you start just, all of a sudden, you're just like overwhelmed. And you're saying, I, I did this one time where I was praying and fasting and we started giving God thanks and we're in a circle. And I just like, well, we got to give God thanks again. We just go around and give God thanks. And I started, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I just felt like I was getting rocked. It's like, God, thank you so much for the oxygen and the water, you know, or whatever, whatever I was saying. And I started praying and I went home and I was so like, just like overwhelmed with Thanksgiving. I told my wife and she chuckled at me. She said, okay, you know, I'm getting weird with it, man. But what happened within me was I was recognizing, wait a minute. I, 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 I mean, guys, I'm not a bird guy. I mean, maybe I am. I don't know. I've never got into birds. So maybe I'm a bird guy. But I, I was just thinking for the birds of the air. I said, God, you created all this creation. And what happened in me was I wasn't just saying, man, I love birds in the air. I love the oxygen that I get to breathe. I was recognizing for the first time, this is from you. For the first time, I was recognizing the external source. And all of a sudden, I got weird in my Thanksgiving. And, and I want to say this to you right now. There are so, it's unlimited things that you could be thankful for. There's unlimited things. When I, when I call you at the church up and I say, hey guys, give the Lord thanks. I'm not asking you to say, God, what good things are in my life? I want you to recognize that the good things are from Him. And that you can go, God, there's unlimited things I can recognize you for. I recognize that you've done this for me. How many of you guys are married in here? Man, I go, man, God, thank you for my spouse. When I was single, I would say, God, thank you for my singleness. This is from you. This leper decided, I'm going to go back to the person who gave me what I love. Your Thanksgiving is not about recognizing what you have. It's about recognizing what you have and who gave it to you. Amen. This is what Thanksgiving is. And my job today is to tell you to make an investment in your thought life, in your words, with your mouth, to start giving more thanks. Are you guys down for that? 
And I want to tell you right now that you have some returns on this kind of investment. And the returns on Thanksgiving are some of my favorite returns in life. And I want to say this. This is going to unlock, if I could say it this way, mysteries in your life. How many of you guys struggle with hatred? Anyone in here struggle with hatred? Good. What a good church. A few of us. Okay. That's okay. You're, I don't, I don't blame you. Why did I ask that question and tell you to raise your hand? Come on. That was messed up. Yeah, I deal with hatred. <laughs> <laughs> Who's murdered someone? Like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we're not going to do that. My bad. That was messed up. How many of you guys have dealt with anxiety and worry? Anyone in here? Man, come on. Some of us are stricken with this stuff. I'm going to give you some cool ROIs, return on your investment. And I'm going to start with Luke 17, 11 through 19, the story we just read. Our first return on investment and in investing and in recognizing what we have and who it came from, like that leper did. The first return on the investment I want to talk about is this. God will give you more. God will give you more. Now, hey, listen, I'm going to say something right now. Me saying that, automatically is going to put a red flag in your head. <laughs> and this is why. Because we've just been overwhelmed with this idea that God giving more means that God is going to give us this prosperity life within the world. And he's going to establish our earthly kingdom. But when I say God will give you more, I'm talking about what he did for the leper, the one leper who came back that he didn't do for the other nine. Now, I was bothered by the scripture forever until last night I was sitting down reading it and I just decided to look up a word. So there's this thing that I noticed. One guy comes back to Jesus. The other nine leave. And I usually just say, yeah, and Jesus spoke to him. But there's something really crazy what he says. If you go to verse 19 of Luke 17, Luke 19, and it says, and Jesus said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now that bothered me because the other nine were well too. So why did he, well, I didn't get it. So I decided to look up as made you well, because maybe in your translation it says made you whole. Anyone have that translation opened up right now? That was a test to see if you guys are even reading the Bible with me. <laughs> so I looked it up. I said, what word is this, is this whole or well? I, I don't get it. And I expected to see healed. But you know what word I found? It's a Greek word called sozo. It means Salvation. That means restoration, not physically, spiritually. In fact, that word specifically means from the wrath of God. Well, what? So when I went back and read this, I thought, wait a minute. Jesus tells him something even greater than the other nine missed. They all got healed, but only one. Only one fulfilled the two-step process, and only that one was said, hey, you have received salvation today. Come on, somebody. When I tell you there's more, is God could give you all the same gift, but the one who comes back and gives him thanksgiving and praise will receive even more than the other nine. How many of you guys have received good things from the Lord? Let me tell you a little secret. He has more for you. All you got to do is go give him some thanks. He has more for you. There's another story I want to point out because I, I love this, man. Uh, 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 look, uh, let me say this. Everyone received the gift. They were grateful for the gift. But the one who recognized and gave gratitude to the giver, Jesus said, Sozo is now yours. Salvation is yours. Check this out, man. Your first return on investment is you'll get more from God. There's more for you when you go into Thanksgiving. I'm actually reading my notes to make sure I'm on track. So hang on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, this is good. Oh, yeah, I want to jump to another story in scriptures about another guy who gave thanksgiving and he received salvation. Do you guys know the story of Daniel in the lion's den? I love that story. Anyone in here love that story? Four of us? Come on. Guys, he was going to get eaten by lions, right? Starving lions, and he does it. That's wild, man. And this is what happened. If you got your kids in kids' church, they're learning this story right now. It says this, man, in, first, uh, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. All right, give you some background. Daniel is getting put up to the test. Everybody besides the king hates Daniel. They're jealous. He's, he's a high official. And they recognize that Daniel likes to pray to God all the time. Now, I use this scripture all the time for prayer, but I want to show you about Daniel. Daniel wasn't just a man of prayer. And so they made a, a, a whole law that said if for the next month, if anyone prays to anybody else but King Darius, then that person needs to be thrown into the lion's den. And it says this in verse 10. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that new law, he went home 
and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and he gave thanks. Everyone say thanks before his God, as was his custom since the early days. Do you know what happens at the end of that story? Daniel gets in trouble because he was given prayer and thanks to God and God saves his life from the lion's den. Well, time out, what? Because this whole time, I just thought, man, Daniel was just this guy who liked to pray a lot. No, no, no. Daniel was a man who made it a discipline in his life. Every day, three times a day, just like he was a kid, he said, God, I'm going to sit before you. And I'm going to recognize what you've given to me. And I'm going to recognize that you're the one who gave it to me. The end of his story is salvation. In fact, if I go through any story of people who have great Thanksgiving, each one of them have more than the guy who just received the blessing. Each one of them come out with sozo, salvation. This is your first return on investment. If you will give God thanks, He will reward you even more. But there's more to this. If you've got your Bibles, James 4, 6. And I want to just say this about receiving salvation. This is how I know that Thanksgiving produces salvation. Now, I'm not talking about salvation from hell. I'm talking about salvation from circumstances. I'm talking about sozo. I'm talking about God coming in. Though salvation from hell too. And this is how I know. Because thanksgiving will always produce humility. Look to your neighbor. Look him in the eye. And say, you need humility. Tell him. Tell him. Tell your other neighbor because they probably really need it. Tell your other neighbor even harder. Like, tell him, like, hey, you really need it. Go ahead. Check this out. Those who give thanks are made whole. They receive salvation. Of course they do. Because when you recognize what you've been given and who, you was, who it was given from, you put yourself in a place of humility. You recognize, I didn't do this on my own. Let me get back into my position. Here's an easy one. I'm not getting my income, God, based on my strength alone. You have given me favor. I recognize you today. You know what happens when you do that? All of a sudden, it's not about how great you are. It's about how great He is. And when you walk in thanksgiving, humility enters in. Now, I didn't put that as a return on investment. I'm going to tell you why. Because most of us don't want that return on investment. How many of you guys have ever prayed for humility? Anyone in this place ever prayed for humility? Worst prayer ever. Have you have you never done this? <laughs> I'm not sounding really well. You should try it today. God, humble me. <laughs> I used to think... That when God humbled me, he was going to humiliate me. And sometimes it felt that way. I pray to God, God, will you humble me? And I felt like seriously the next week, all the worst things could happen. I get a speeding ticket or whatever, you know. I don't know why that's the worst thing. Okay, that's pretty spoiled. <laughs> well, the worst thing would happen. And I'd sit there and go, God, why is this happening? And I realized... That he was putting me in a place that even when things weren't great, would I still recognize that he's good in my life and give him thanks still. And that true humility always was a place of saying, God, I'm going to praise you and give you thanks even in my worst of circumstances. Daniel was a man of humility. God, I want to die for praying to you, but I want to recognize how good you are first. And it says this in James, if you don't know this, James 4, 6 but he, God, gives more grace. Therefore, God says, God resists the proud. I want to say resist. That means pushes away. Now, I want you to hear me out really quick. No one said resist. Everyone say resist. Resist, resist means to fight, to go against. It says, man, God will resist the proud. That means he will fight against them. Have you ever thought about that? That your pride isn't just the little sin that you have. Your pride is the thing that God's going to fight you on. And then he says, but... He gives grace to the humble. What if I told you when you give thanksgiving, it produces humility, which produces his grace, which produces you getting saved by him. Your first ROI is this. You get more. Look to your neighbor and say, I want more. Say it. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, I really want more. Get greedy with it. You know, what's that duck's name? You used to dive into the gold. You guys know what I'm talking about. Get that greedy with it. ROI, number two. Oh, I forgot. That is true. This is actually the next one I was going into. I was, I was giving it away. When you walk in Thanksgiving, your second one is your humility increases. Oh, I, I got all messed up, but this is what I want to read to you. This is incredible. I've read in a great book. I told you guys this last week. I'm going to tell you again. Humility increases in your Thanksgiving. 
There's this book I read. It's called In the Hiding Place. It's a Corey Ten Boone with an N because I got corrected the other day. Corey Ten Boone. Do you guys know who this young girl is? Her father was hiding Jews in, her, in their house when they're in World War II. And they ended up getting caught. They got ratted out. And in that, because they were hiding Jews, they became the enemy. And so they imprisoned these two young girls and their father. And I won't give up the whole story because it's a beautiful book. And I promised you guys I was going to order it here so you could pick it up because it's a book I encourage you to read. But Corey had a sister named Betsy. And what happened is because they were Christians and they were protecting and hiding Jews in their house, they were stripped of everything. I mean, they were stripped of their clothes. They were stripped of their, their finances. They were stripped. At one point, they are in total isolation for months. And the only thing that they desired more than anything was the Word of God. How many guys love your Bible? Anyone in here? I love my Bible. And all she wanted was the Bible. So they got the Word of God and they're being transported. And the war is coming to an end. And the one thing they don't want to happen is they don't want to be transported from their country in Hungary to go all the way over to Germany. Because once they're in the Germany lines... They're afraid that they'll never be set free. Well, as the story goes, as Germany's uh, uh, slowly retreating backwards, they start pulling their prisoners with them back into the Germany lines. And they're on a train and they're driving back on the train and they're, they're piled in and they're watching as they're going further and further into Germany and they're thinking, this is it. And Betsy and, and, and Corey, they get into a room and it is the nastiest room, man. It's like full of lice. It's dark and dingy. How many of you guys have ever had lice before? Anyone in here? How many of you guys have ever been to a summer camp? You've probably had lice then, okay? But this was infested. They said they could see the lice on the floor. It's this disgusting place. And they shoved these girls in there. And something that they did miraculously was they hid their Bible and they snuck it into their little cell. And in this cell was a bunch of women. They put a bunch of women in there because they're all the prisons are coming together. So they're all packed out in this big old kind of living room type uh, cell. And they're all in there together. And this is what uh, Betsy and Corey say to one another. Betsy says, you know what? We have the answer because they don't want to be in this place. They're looking at this place going, this is terrible. How many of you guys have ever uh, walked into a place and thought, I can't stay here and walked out? Anyone ever done that before? Yeah, me too, man. How many of you guys have done it here? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, I, I went to a, a restaurant with my wife one time. It's a quick story. I went to a restaurant with my wife one time and, and it was closed. We didn't know it was closed. And it, was, it was a barbecue place. It was, it was the most disgusting place I've ever been in my life. And, and we walked in and the guy would, happened to have the door open. He's like, oh, come in, I'll serve you guys. And there was just stuff all over. And I was like, I need to just use the restroom. He said, yeah, go right back there. And I walked in that restroom and I walked immediately out. <laughs> There's no way I was going in there. Not me. I'm, I'm a little bit above that bathroom, okay? At least that's what I thought. I can't lower myself to be that disgusting. But these girls walk into the place and they're panicking. They're going, this is disgusting. And Betsy says, wait a minute, wait a minute. All the answers are in the Word of God. What does the Word say? And so they said, we read something just the other night. What was it? So they open up the book of Thessalonians. If you have your Bible, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Verse 16 says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So this is what Betsy does. She says, well, we could be thankful. Let's thank God that we have the Bible. Corey says, yeah, let's thank God. So they say, God, thank you so much that we have the Bible. Then Betsy says, well, let's thank God that all these other women are in here. We've been isolated. Let's thank God that all these other women are in here. Yes, let's thank God. Thank you, Jesus, that we have these other women in here. We can preach the gospel to them. Then she says, man, we, we should give thanks that, that, that we're still alive. Yeah, God, thank you for, thank, for, for us being still alive. Then Betsy says, we should thank God for the lice. And Corey says, hold up, dude. And she just points back this and says, no, no, the Bible gave us instruction in everything, give thanks. Hey, listen, when you give thanks and you make it a discipline, it humbles you. Because the things that you think that, man, I can't live that way. But if you walk into it and you go, God, I'm going to give you thanks for this right now, something changes inside of you. All of a sudden they start thanking God for the lice. And can I just tell you something? They slept in that lice for weeks. And they just kept saying, let's give God thanks. Let's give God thanks. Let's give God thanks. Humbling themselves. God, I, I'm so happy that you put me here. I trust you. It ends up later on, the guards would leave that whole group alone. They were singing songs. They were reading the word together. They were bold about it. No one came in there and beat them up for it. No one stole their stuff. 
Finally, one day, all the guards were standing at the door. They want to enter in. And they thought maybe they were just whatever. And they realized, one of the ladies says, I can't go in, there's too much lice. So Betsy looked to her sister and said, look at what God's done with the lice. He's allowed us to worship him freely. You know, I love that story. Because she didn't see the lice as a curse. She was humble enough to say, God, I will give you thanks even for the things I don't like. It's the Romans 8, 28. This is the humble person would say this. All things work together for those who love him. Man, they were just living it up. And I want to say this about humility. You see, when you guys give, how many of you guys are thankful for what God's done in your life? Anyone in here thankful for what God's? Okay, thanking God in retrospect is to thank him for what he's already done. And that's good. You should do that. But when you thank God for your present circumstances, a lice infested jail cell, you lose your job. You get pulled over and you don't got the money to pay a ticket. And you say, God, I want to thank you anyways. You know what you're saying? God, I'm humble enough to trust that you will get me through this regardless. You see, when you thank God and you make the discipline, and you say, God, I'm going to thank you in my present circumstances. What you're really saying is, God, I know what you've done. I know what you can do. You're doing step two all the way through. I recognize who's the one who's giving me these good gifts. And even in my trials and tribulations, even in my hard times, I'm going to give you thanks because I know who you are. Amen. ROI number two, your return on investment is you get humility. Humility produces grace. Okay, I hear that. This is my last one. This is where I'm landing, actually. Lastly, the ROI that you get in Thanksgiving. Number one, let me go backwards. Number one, you get more. Everyone who gave thanks, he says, man, you were made whole. You got sozo today. Daniel, he was saved. Everyone we see in Thanksgiving, they, they walked in salvation. Number two, it produces humility in your life so you can receive the grace of God. But number three, you're going to love this one. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. <laughs> There's a lot of ends in there. Thanksgiving eliminates anxiety. I'm not going to get into the word first. I want to tell you about a joint study done in the University of California in Miami. They did a joint study about Thanksgiving. And what they found is that when you are thankful, you have gratitude, your brain cannot have anxiety inside of it. Check this out. The studies show that from the same part of the brain that worry and anxiety comes. If you start going into Thanksgiving, anxiety cannot exist in your mind at the same time as Thanksgiving. That's nuts. I didn't read you the word yet because I know that sometimes if I read the scripture that says that, we go, well, I got to walk that in faith. I want to remove faith. I want to give you a fact. Thanksgiving eliminates anxiety and worry in your life. I want to just stop you for a second. Let me ask that question. How many of you guys have dealt with anxiety a lot? Anyone in here? How many of you guys have had some major scares? Anyone in here? How many of you guys have woke up worried so bad that you couldn't go back to sleep? You ever have those days? Man, how many of you guys remember high school and taking tests? Oh. You okay? Oh, good. I think the sound guy just had anxiety right now. Oh, God, we give you thanks for what's happened up here. These guys did a study. And they were trying to find out what Thanksgiving does to the brain. The, 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 the craziest thing they found out is people can't have anxiety while they're thankful. The two can't coexist. You can't be worried and flustered about what the future might be if you're sitting in Thanksgiving I want to be honest with you. I'm, how many of you guys are so happy for people who are studying these kind of things? Anyone in here? What a great tip. But this, is, this isn't new news. Because Philippians 4, 6 tells us that. I don't know if you know Philippians 4, 6, but it says, Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. He didn't put a period there. He, he wasn't commanding you. He says, but instead... In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And this is what will happen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you are struggling with anxiety, how am I going to get enough money to do this? How am I going to get through this? How am I supposed to make it? How am I, 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 some people are so stricken and beat up and, and pulled down and, and, and tied up. 
with these thoughts in their mind. I, I, I like to call it a false prophet. This voice in your head declaring all the things that might not work out. And Paul wrote it down. And, and, and later on, these, these guys who are studying the brain, Paul writes it down and says, oh, hey, check this out, man. You don't need anxiety in your life. And some of us have waken up so many times and we just have this anxiety, nail us in the head. I'm not good enough. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. What am I doing wrong? All of a sudden, you, you, you don't know how to talk to people. You, you get frozen. People are locking themselves in their house going, I just can't go outside. I can't see anybody right now. And anxiety is just overwhelming them. Worry is overwhelming them. And this Philippians 4, 8, or 4, 6 is just like, hey, no, no, listen, listen, listen. My fellow believers, anxiety doesn't need to exist. As long as you have Thanksgiving, it doesn't even have a place to stay. Believers, if you just, just go to the Father with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, making your request known, God, I'm so thankful that you've given life. I don't like it, Father. I wish I wasn't here, but I give you thanks anyways for my circumstances. He says, this is the byproduct. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. That means even in the face of how crazy it truly is, when people look at you and go, bro, look at the facts. You say, yeah, but I got peace in this. He says, it will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ. Church, I, I could preach maybe four more sermons on this one topic, but I, I just want to get these three returns to you. You can change your life. You go walk and receive more from God than you ever have before. Church, you can walk and have humility in every circumstance, receiving His grace. Church, you don't ever have to deal with anxiety. Ever. You don't have to. You can, but I, I think you know anxiety is an abusive relationship with you. All you have to do is make one discipline in your life. Like Daniel, every day, I'm going to give you thanks, God. I'm going to recognize all the good things I have, all the outcomes I've ever had. I'm going to say, I recognize you gave them to me. And in doing so, Father, I'm going to come to you with my whole heart like that one leper and say, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you healed me. And I know what the return is when you and I do that. You're going to give, be given salvation. More. You're going to be humble. No pride. You won't have to fight the Lord anymore. And anxiety doesn't have a place in your mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. Now, I'm not going to pray that you would feel like you have more Thanksgiving inside of you. No, no, no. I'm going to pray that today when you leave this place, you make a decision in your life from here on out, I'm going to be thankful. And I'm going to do the unnatural thing. I'm not going to let the things around me consume me. Today, I want to declare how thankful I am to God for my circumstances. I want to declare how thankful I am to God for what He's given to me. And today, I hope you leave making an investment, changing your life with thanksgiving. So why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to have you bow your head and close your eyes. I'm a big believer in prayer. If you're in this house today, listen. And you're going, man, I, I feel, I'm going to walk backwards on these ROIs. But you're in this place, and you're just going, man, I feel like I've just had anxiety in my life. I feel like I've been beat up in my life. I feel like my worth is all off. And you're in this house today, and you deal with anxiety. I want to pray a simple prayer over you. Or maybe you're in this house and you've just been saying, God, I don't feel humble. I don't, I don't feel like I have your grace in my life. I feel like I'm over here trying to do everything on my own. And today you're going, man, I, I need humility in my life. 
Or maybe you're here today and you feel like you've come up short with what God's given you. And you're looking around and going, man, I, I feel like I got some of the same gifts. I, I said the same prayer as everyone else in this house. But why does it feel like I don't have as much? And tell you, you want more. What I'm going to do, I'm going to pray over you that God would gently remind you tonight when you lay in your bed, tomorrow morning when you wake up, that, 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 this, that next afternoon when you're eating your food, that you would genuinely recognize what you have and who gave it to you. So Father, I just want to pray over everyone. I'm not going to have raised hands. I want to pray over everybody. Father, help us today. Help us take on the discipline of being thankful. Oh, Father, complaining has just poured out of some of us, Father. Oh, God, the desire for more things in the world has just poured out, God. Some of us have been just struggling, going, I hate what I'm in today. But God, I just pray, Father, that each one of us, you would remind us gently through your Holy Spirit. Say, hey, remember Betsy? In her circumstances of prison, humiliation, and lice, she gave me thanks. Hey, she was saved in that. In her humility, she was given more. She had no anxiety or fear of what was going on in the prison cell anymore. Father, I pray that over us. That God, we would start diving deeper in our investment of saying, I got to be thankful and God, I pray that over each one of us, that there would just be like that, that conviction in our heart, like, like when on New Year's, when we get the conviction to work out. I pray for that, but even greater. That we say, no, I got to make myself into a place where every day I recognize the good outcomes I have. And I recognize the good person who gave it to me. His name is Jesus. And that God, we'd be a people of the one, not the nine, of the one who could receive sozo, who could be made into salvation through you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If you were encouraged by today's message, be sure to share it with your friends and family that they might also be encouraged. We are so excited that you chose to grow in God's word with us today, and we hope that you'll make plans to join us again. We believe that you were not made to walk this life alone. So if you can, come see us at the Atlanta Dream Center Church, Sundays, 10 a.m. and Wednesdays, 7 p.m. If you'd like to support this ministry, find out more about who we are or listen to previous sermons, log on to www.dreamcenterchurch.com for more information. Thank you for listening. Now let's go do the great things God has called us to do.